Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Okay, so that's me. We run this thing called the Life Design Lab at Stanford. You know, um, and a little shout out, I don't do that alone, Bill Burnett, who actually runs the design program at Stanford. You know, we did this thing together. Now, the question really is why are we doing that? Why, why are you teaching about life, you know, with relatively smart people at Stanford University? Well, we're user-based oriented people, so let's go talk to the user. Let's find out. If you ask Stanford students the following question, what are you going to do when you get out of here? What insightful thoughts do you hear? interesting. I was going to go to med school, but some grades changed that. I think I'm going to go to law school. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Listen carefully. Uh, uh, I... <laughs> That's my favorite right there. I have no idea. Okay, now, did we wait around all day long to catch the 10 clueless kids at Stanford to make that video? No, it took six minutes. Now here's a little insight. Where did we get these insightful comments? At a career fair. <laughs> True story. This, you know, putting on the clean clothes, gonna be ready to talk to the grown-ups. And by the way, what do you want to do when you get out of here? Uh, I don't know. You know. Um, now, why is this true? Oh, look, being smart is not the same thing as being clear. Being good at school, which they all are, has nothing to do with being good at life. We sort of forgot to teach you that part. So that means now we have a mission. What's our mission? Our mission is to apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after university. If you double click on the colored words, you can get a white paper. Now, by the way, am I talking too fast? Good, because I'm not going to slow down. So the, <laughs> just wanted to see if I'm offending you yet. Now, by the way, that's kind of a confusing way to put it. That's sort of like the, the elevator pitch. So the more rational way to say it is, hey, we're just the guys who teach the class to help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up, which is a lousy way of saying it. What we really want to say is, we want to help you figure out what you want to be next as you keep growing. Because how many of you can't wait until you get to be all done growing up? I want to finish that off, because then I get to be dead. That's really great. You know, um, <laughs> No, we're going to keep growing, you know, but how do you do this thing? You know, we're making it up as we go along. So that's what we do. And when we say it this way, people all go, ooh, can I take the class? And up until recently, unless you were one of the 16,000 people on our campus, you're one of the other 7.2 billion, we said, eh, no. So we, we wrote the book, and we wrote the book simply because everyone would say, ooh, can I take the class, please, you know? And then I thought that was a dumb idea because people don't read books anymore. You know, they just implant stuff in their feet. They, um... <laughs> And listen to the universe. I mean, why, why would you read my book and when you could listen to the universe? You know, uh, but that became a bestseller. And then in, in the Herb says, come talk to you. And so why is this happening? Why is this conversation continuing to go on? Well, there's a reason. The reason is because people are stuck. You know, people are stuck <laughs> on this challenging issue of how to live their lives, you know. And, and they're stuck because of what we call dysfunctional beliefs, which are ideas that are either just flat not true or they're not generative. They're not usually helpful, but they're popular. A couple of examples. Okay, uh, number one. Now, we're talking about college a little bit. I teach in the college world these days. I've apparently become an educator, uh, despite being an unemployed marketing guy. Um, and so, hey, what are you majoring in? I'm majoring in you know, anthropology with a minor in creative writing, and you all know the next question. What is it? Why? <laughs> what, it's, you know, what are you going to do with that, right? What are you going to do with that? Which, of course, is a dysfunctional belief. Why is it dysfunctional? Because the research shows within five to 10 years of graduation, 80% of college graduates are working outside their field of baccalaureate study. Quickly, how many of you are doing right now what you studied when you were 19? All four of you can have a little club in the back. That's great. You know, so this question is an invalid question. It's not helpful. Then, of course, the critical question in the modern culture, what's your passion? Properly pronounced, what's your passion? What's your passion? Is this real? Are you passionate? Are you living the passion? Are you? Are you? Are you? Dude. The research shows eight out of 10 people answer the question, either I don't know yet, I'm hoping to find one, or which one did you want to hear about first? Eight out of 10 people, this question treats as in need of remediation because you do not have the single one powerful organizing passion that will drive your life forward. You know, it turns out to really not work for hardly anybody. Watch out if you even have one, by the way. I mean, I had a passion when I was 18. I loved the Jacques Cousteau story, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, a TV show. I know I should be a marine biologist. I didn't happen to notice that he had sons. They were going to take over the work. They, the job was not available. So then I had another passion called, you know, solve the energy crisis. I have a master's in thermosciences and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Of course I should be, you know, working in software. Uh, and... I came out trying to solve the energy crisis in 1976, 35 years before anybody cared. So watch out for having a passion. It may not work, even if you've got one. Now, moving on. Be the best you. Are you being the best you? Are you? 
In business, we say the good is the enemy of the better. The better is the enemy of the best. Are you being your best? Are you, are you, are you? That Tony Robbins thing, you know? Um, Here's the problem with this. You know, if you're feeling good, you know, are you really sure you're doing the right thing? You're not settling. Are you, God, you're not settling? Except the truth is, all of us have more aliveness in us than one lifetime will permit us to live. There's more than one of you in there, which means we have to answer the question, how many? How many of there are you? We do a really quick experiment. It's called a Gedanken experiment, a scientific experiment you do imaginally in your head, Gedanken through German. Imagine that the multiverse was real. There are infinite parallel universes, just angstroms apart. And imagine that string theory is true, and we can now manage proactively concurrent consciousness. Moon's going, that's going to be so great. You know? um, <laughs> she's already there a little bit. The, uh, and, uh, and so you can be as many of you as you want. But it's kind of like reservations. You have to reserve ahead. You have to reserve slots. You can't have as, uh, an infinite number. You have to reserve ahead. You have to come up with a number about how many places in the multiverse you'd like to reserve so you can be all the people you want to be, all the variations of you that you might think interesting, including if one version of you you like a lot, you want to repeat, go ahead. My daughter Lisa thought a good way to spend the entire day at Disneyland the first time she went was ride Dumbo 42 times. <laughs> if you want to do Dumbo 42 times, fine. So I'm going to go one, two, three. When I would have said four, you say a number, which is how many slots in the multiverse, how many lives might you be able to live into in an interesting way? As many as you want, but just let me know what the number is, okay? Think of the number. One, two, three. Oh, come on, I know we're in Britain and you don't shop, but we're gonna do that a little better. I'm an American noisy person, make me feel good, please. One, two, three. Oh, 10, 12, 6, 18, okay, the median was mm, 7.4. Look, you're mostly not gonna happen, I lied. Um, you just get one, but don't worry about the FOMO thing. This fear of missing out, it's not an issue. Of course you're gonna miss out. You're overwhelmingly gonna miss out. You will mostly not happen. How many of you have a smartphone? Duh, okay, it can spell Google, duh, okay. That means you're gonna see stuff go by. You're gonna see this amazing world go by overwhelmingly. You're gonna barely get to participate. So skip the whole FOMO thing. Of course you're missing out. That just means you're awake, you're a capacious person in a target-rich environment. Welcome to the community. <laughs> but just choose well. Now, how do we choose? I mean, I'd love to be, you know, voice-based, you know, techno augmented and re use the right emoji at the right time, but which life do I do it in? That's the problem, you know. There are lots of great yous. In fact, our key thing is we're gonna, we, if we had time, we'd have you come up with three completely different versions of yourself on an eight and a half by 11 or A1 sheet of paper. In 15 minutes, you could all do it. We haven't got time. Um, but trust me, it's never too late. I mean, you're like so way young, it's way not too late. Um, so we build our way forward by using design thinking. Now, very briefly, who's heard of design? in this crowd, of course. Um, I'm gonna give you like a two minute overview of design thinking. It is, first of all, one of a number of ways to think. There's lots of ways to think. There's engineering thinking, which is a really good solution to problems known as tame problems that are well-bounded problems. If you know the material strength of stuff, you know the equations, you can solve the problem. I have two engineering degrees, I love solving problems, they say solve, that's great. Then there's business thinking. In business, you're never right, you're never done, the customer never loves you enough, the profitability is never high enough, the competitor is never distanced enough, you're never done, and you're never actually right, but you can get better. And you can get better in a quantitative way if you actually went to a business school and paid a lot of money to prove to yourself that you're thinking smartly, you know, then you can actually go do that in a very optimized way. Business people optimize continually. Researchers. Research in a very specific analytic way. Sarah's got a PhD that has a very specific meaning. She actually had to create a form of rigorous knowledge that never existed before using dependent and independent variables and a certain kind of thing going all the way back to Aristotle and Socrates. You know, and we now know that you too are a smart person. You get the three stripes and the funny hat and you can teach at Goldsmiths. You are now a legitimate thinker because you've analyzed well. But all these forms of thinking don't solve a big class of problems called wicked problems, which are messy problems where you don't even know if you're right until you're done. Once you're done, you can't reuse the solution anywhere else. And in those situations, which are really human problems, you'd build your way forward. You can't think your way forward because we're doing this thing called inventing the future. None of you have been there before, so we're making it up as we go along. Frankly, all we're teaching people is the improv theater skill of being good at the skit called life because we're making it up as we go along. Now, design is two things. It's a process, these five steps. Um, we've taught it this way for a long, long time, but it's, the key thing is it starts with empathy. We don't ask the question in define. What problem are we solving? We ask after we do the research. We problem find before we problem solve. That really makes the outcomes very different. And we always start with accept. You can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. 
many people you'll hear complain about their life situation. And it sounds like they're complaining about the problem, but they're really not complaining about the problem. They're complaining about their problem with the problem. And if you've got a problem with your problem, that's a problem. Because <laughs> you can't solve that problem. You've got to start where you are. Trust me, where you are is exactly where the right thing is going to happen. We work from there. And we have a set of mindsets. Uh, <clears throat> Max mentioned Carol Dweck, one of our colleagues, uh, who talks about the learning mindset. In, in design, the mindsets we focus in on are these five. We start with curiosity, the source of an, an immense amount of human energy. From that, we often radically collaborate, talk to lots of different people. That conversation will probably make us have new points of view. We reframe things, look at them differently. We started with an open mind, then we start forming that mindset. We're mindful of processes as we go along, and eventually do stuff. It's about a bias to action. Now, when we apply that stuff into how to do life design, that was the idea we had 12 years ago. Well, you know, what comes up with all kinds of stuff, and there's a three-layered framework and 40 things, and we haven't got time to talk about that. So, hey, Dave, could you simplify it? Well, okay, fine. <laughs> <clears throat> this actually happened being shoved onto a Canadian uh, television stage uh, for a morning interview with a three-minute interview, and the associate producer grabbed me by the shoulder and goes, oh, by the way, we need the book in one sentence. Um, I said, excuse me, we're a professors at a college. We don't do one sentence answers. He goes, well, then you're off the air. And I said, give me a minute. Uh, so <laughs> so, so the, the actually four sentences, but not a lot of words. So it is really get curious, talk to people, try stuff, and then tell your story. Um, <clears throat> let's go quickly through them. Get curious. This really is the heart. If you remember anything I said today, because I'm saying a lot really fast. Um, but again, I always talk this fast. Um, it's get curious. And by that, I mean curate your curiosity. Lean into this thing. Actually develop it. Don't forget what that child always knew how to do. In particular, you want to do that by pursuing latent wonderfulness. Hence Eric, my friend Eric. Now, his name wasn't Eric, and that's not his face, but it's a real person. Um, now, before I... <clears throat> <laughs> There's a real guy, not, not Eric, who doesn't look like that, but nonetheless... Uh, uh, I have to ask a question first. Now, by the way, I happen to be highly connected to some serious executives at Aetna Insurance. It's not Lloyd's of London, but it's a really big, incredibly old, strong, and powerful insurance company. How many of you can't wait to get my, my contact? How many of you really hot, like, ooh, tell me more about Aetna Insurance? <laughs> Just need to check out the insurance people. Okay, fine. Just hold it to the side. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, so, you know, Eric's trying to figure out what to do with his life, and, 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 and we're, we're talking about who to go talk to, and I said, well, hey, you know, would you like to go meet with these people I know who are working on a particular problem? How many of you think the problem I'm about to describe is kind of interesting? It turns out, you know, as boomers, people like me, I'm 65, I have seven grandchildren, um, <clears throat> and I um, get older and infirm, you know, we're this huge burden on reality, you know, and if they all go to the hospital, we're all going to die broke. So we need to completely transform what families mean, we need to transform what communities mean, what, can, what care taking means, you know, and so if there's a way that the internet, you know, through AI and community creating applications could empower caregivers in a, in a much broader way to take care of more people at home, healthier in intergenerational communities, and do so at a massive savings of expense, you know, and a massive reduction in caretaker fatigue, which is causing PTSD in people's children. You know, how many think that that's a worthwhile problem? We should solve that problem. That's an interesting problem. Great. So that problem is being worked on by Aetna Insurance. They have an internal organization who's developing that technology, and my friend Eric, who doesn't look like that, and it isn't called Eric, uh, is working on that team because he learned how to pursue latent wonderfulness. He didn't start with the presupposition, oh, big insurance company, eh, pff, pff, no, who wants to do that? Insurance is bad, insurance is bad. Um, that's pursuing presuppositional skepticism, you know, where you want to pursue latent wonderfulness, which means every, look, there's a whole bunch of people in that building, there's got to be something amazing going on there. It's my job to go find it. Amazing is happening all over the place. Your chance of finding amazing goes way up if you presuppose that it's there. If you arrive and they go, oh, they're actually all incredibly boring old white men. Okay, you know, um, <clears throat> fine, skip it, move on. But if you start with latent wonderfulness, you're gonna go a lot further. Talk to people. When you get out there, you gotta talk to people. That's where all the action is. You know, Max again is to start with people. Couldn't agree more. So, and get their story. You're not there to get the money, to get the transaction, to get the job, to get the deal. You're not trying to make something happen. You're just trying to get the story. You know, it turns out, let's say this is Anna talking to, 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 you know, to Joe. And, and if Anna does the research and she's interested in what's going on in some world of, let's say, what's going on in the world of craft teapots, you know, uh, and, and Joe's the guy. And she calls him and says, hey, Joe, it turns out I've done the research and you are the most interesting person in the world. We should get together, you know, you and me, because we have this common interest. I think you're fascinating. You think you're fascinating. We agree. 
let's get together, I'll buy the coffee, I'll buy the tea. You know, and that really works. So get out there and have that story because interested is interesting. The gold standard in curiosity is you actually want to know something from somebody who actually knows, they probably want to talk to you because interested is interesting. Curiosity is incredibly powerful. Now, don't just talk about it, go do it. Gee, could I actually show up in your, you know, your craft antique teapot restoration lab and hang out with you for a day? Could I actually go learn how to ride a unicorn that looks like a horse, you know, whatever it might be. Try something, give it a test drive. Set the bar low and clear it. Everyone's trying to inspire you to do amazing things. Screw that. Do really easy things over and over again. <laughs> it's much, much easier, and you'll actually get real progress, you know, because the whole point is, and don't forget, trying stuff is doing stuff. Well, I don't know what I'm doing yet. You know, well, go try this. I haven't really committed to that. No, no. Trying stuff is doing stuff. If you accept that we have to invent the future by building it, if you're simply working on even trying to curate your curiosity, what are you working on? I'm trying to find out what I'm fascinated by. I'm having a great time working on that. As opposed to, I have the fiendest idea what I'm doing. Could you tell me, please? <laughs> um, you know, do you know who I am? I haven't found me yet. You know, so trying stuff is really doing stuff. You know, repeat until engaged. And then tell your story. Why tell your story? OK, this is, this is kind of crucial. So people don't often get why this is important. Because again, curated curiosity plus reflection equals a story. If you're out there curating your curiosity, you're talking to people, you're trying stuff, then you think about what happened to me? What did that mean to me? What was that like? And what's my insight about that? Or what further questions is that generating within me as my aliveness is getting more alive? Now, you go out there and have that conversation with people, kind of like, you know, hey, how's it going? Oh, I watched Homeland again. <laughs> episode 32, section, session, you know, uh, episode 32 in, in season four was great for the ninth time. That's not very interesting. You know, I actually spent a day sitting in, you know, at Joe's antique teapot restoration lab. Let me tell you what that was like and what I learned about that. That's more interesting. So if you do that, your interested becomes interesting to others because you curated your curiosity. And now you're getting the virtuous cycle working for you. And the virtuous cycle is simply this. Look, you start by what's on your mind. What's, every pile has a top and a bottom, okay? You know, I mean, ski Newcastle, right? The, um, there, there is the best place to ski here. Um, it's not great, don't get me wrong, you know, you're better off going to Switzerland, but there is a, in any pile a top and a bottom. Maybe you're that person that doesn't have a driving interest now, now, much less a passion. Who cares? Take the top of your pile and start working it. Get curious, go talk to people. They're more interested than you, borrow their energy. And then start doing stuff in the world, and then if you tell that story, people are going to go, oh really, I didn't know you were into that, or you should meet this friend of mine. And would you come and have a conversation with us? Would you come and try these things over here? Or did you know these things were happening? You get yourself involved in the human community in this incredible generative way. And it's making curiosity work for you. Uh, Max mentioned learning earlier. I did a whole talk on what's the impact of changing and reframing learning as we all become 100 years old, formed by a big conference in, in the US and DC recently. You know, and I talked, look, learning is just curiosity with legs. Give your curiosity legs. You're learning all the time. Don't think it's about school. It's not about school at all. Now, the whole point being that is what designing your life means, which really means designing your being more alive. And that's how you end up with a well-lived and joyful life. Hope it works for you. Now we're after this thing up. Okay, so we, wait, is there more? Of course, that was the really quick thing. You know, I got 34 seconds. I'm probably going to make it barely. Now, there, I'm not selling, but everybody asks me, oh, can you have the book? Sure, you can have the book. 14 bucks, Amazon, bada bing, bada boom, we're done. It's easy. It's a great book. You know, <laughs> you can even listen to me talk a little less quickly if you want to hear it. Um, our website, which is the book title with a dot in it, has all kinds of free stuff. Download it, give it a shot. You know, can I take the class? Now you can at Creative Live. You can take, you know, 21 modules of online training. So if you thought this was interesting and want to hear it at normal speed, you can give that a try. Um, <laughs> or, or, wait, but am I having the impact I want? Is my life meaningful? If you think that's interesting, you don't want to do this interactively rather than in a lecture. We normally don't talk like this in design. We do stuff. Again, we do stuff. We don't talk about doing stuff. We're going to do stuff. You know, during the lunch hour from 1 to 1.30, we're going to do a 30-minute exercise on how to have what kind of impact in the world you want to have. Maybe you could design your impact. So if that's interesting, come on by. So why does this thing work? It works because you're people. You know, design thinking is the new name for human-centered design. If we make real things that work for real people in the real world, that's a good thing. So designing your life is just trying to be a little more human and in so doing, be more helpful and leave you a little more hopeful. All that super inspiration stuff. There's now 21 Marvel comic movies. So a hot question where I live is, hey, Dave, what's your superpower? I go, I don't have one. I'm a mortal. 
I don't fly, you know, I, 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 I can't walk on water. I'm just a regular guy. I'm just trying to be as human as I can. So in the process of being, you know, thinking digital kind of people looking into the future where we want to become more passionate, balanced, superpower, digital, kale-loving, and innovative, <laughs> dazzling people, you know, can we just be a little more human? Would that be okay? That seems like a good idea. Thanks for your time. <laughs>